Okay, well, thank you very much for the uh, introduction, Abner. And also, uh, thanks to Abner and Bo for the, the invitation, which I accepted about two and a half years ago. And so <laughs> it's <laughs> really nice to finally, uh, finally be able to, uh, uh, to come, and especially to um, give these lectures named for Radeau, who, who um, <clears throat> actually worked in more or less the same area that, that uh, I described. In fact, when I was a graduate student, I learned about <clears throat> Radeau's work on, on the plateau problem. So he was interested also in geometry and <clears throat> calculus of variations and differential equations. So, it's, so I think the, um, the lectures will be <clears throat> very much in the spirit of, of, um, of Radeau's, um, Radeau's interests as well. Um, so um, in this first lecture, um, I actually have two, two separate um, goals. So, so, so first of all, the, <clears throat> the ideas that I'm going to introduce will be used throughout the series. So, so it gives me an opportunity to talk about some of the basics. And I'm going to do it in the context of um, a kind of historical development. Well, first of all, of relativity, of the Einstein equations generally, but also in particular the singularity theorem, which, which is, is um, of particular interest lately because, <clears throat> as, I, as Abner said, the, uh, the uh, Nobel Prize, the 2020 Nobel Prize in physics was given for black holes, and part of it went for the singularity theorem. So it's really the only, um, the only theorem in geometry I know of that, that has, has been awarded the Nobel Prize. Uh, and so I, I want to kind of set the stage for the theorem because it's actually very much in the spirit of uh, the sorts of results. So it's, it's really an application of global differential geometry to, uh, to uh, uh, the uh, structure of space-time. Okay, and so, um, so I'm going to begin by um, introducing the Einstein equation. Then I'll talk a little bit about the initial value problem and gravitational waves. Now, gravitational waves were also a prediction of, of the Einstein equations. Uh, and um, while general relativity had been, had been tested and, and shown to, be a, um, <clears throat> to, uh, to fill in gaps in, in Newtonian gravity, um, no one had ever tested the dynamical features of it. So, so the, the tests prior to um, really a few years ago uh, were done solely in terms of um, uh, calculations based on static or stationary solutions of the Einstein equations. And so gravitational waves are a, a, um, a property of dynamical solutions. And so, um, and so they were expected to exist. Anybody who works in relativity knows the Einstein equations are wave equations, and so you think they're out there, but gravity is so weak of force that they're very hard to detect. And so it was not until 2016 that they were actually detected, and that was also won the 2017 Nobel Prize, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and, then, um, <clears throat> and then I'll talk about black holes, the Schwarzschild solution, and the singularity theorem at the end. Okay, and so um, actually I should say there's a very interesting recent biography of Einstein by Walter Isaacson, which I, which I read about six months ago. And it has a lot of, um, a lot of interesting um, material. And I know there were many earlier ones too, but I, I found this one particularly good. And so, um, so in 1905, uh, Einstein formulated the special theory of relativity. Um, and <clears throat> we'll talk a little about the, the, uh, what that means mathematically later. But it, it turned out that uh, electromagnetism, which is the, the electric force was, was completely compatible with uh, special relativity. Um, the, the Maxwell equations in particular had the correct invariance for, to, be, <clears throat> to be defined over space-time. And in fact, a mathematician might even say that the Maxwell equations actually predict the geometry of uh, special relativity. Um, on the other hand, the second fundamental macroscopic force is gravity. And there's a very successful theory of gravity, of course, which goes back to Newton which I'll talk about <clears throat> a bit also. Uh, and um, uh, that theory is completely incompatible with special relativity. So Einstein was very much bothered by, by, uh, by the fact that, that special relativity didn't include gravity. And so he worked for the next 10 years to search for a theory that, that a relativistic theory of gravity. And so um, <clears throat> uh, after many false starts, many of which are described in, in, in the biography I mentioned, um, uh, and with also the help of some mathematicians, including Grossman, who was a friend of Einstein, and also Hilbert made a key um, contribution.
contribution to the um, getting the correct form of the equations. So eventually, uh, he formulated the, um, the general theory of relativity. That was around 1915. Um, and it achieved the goal of, of unifying the um, uh, gravity with, with special relativity. And so the theory relies on work done by Riemann in the mid-19th century on uh, <clears throat> higher dimensional curve spaces. So higher dimensional generalization of Gauss's theory in, in two dimensions. And so let me say a little bit about Newtonian gravity. So um, <clears throat> just some high school physics. So, um, so the basic postulate for Newtonian gravity is that um, two massive objects <clears throat> will attract each other. Uh, and they attract each other with a force which is uh, proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distances between their centers. And so, um, and so there's a little picture of that. So that's, that's the starting point, and we can sort of understand that a little better um, uh, by thinking of the force field associated to a massive object. So, Imagine putting a massive object at the origin in R3, and then <clears throat> you can say that the uh, object has mass m, and then you could <clears throat> look at any point in R3 and ask what would be the force on a unit mass, a unit test mass at that point. And uh, Newtonian gravity would give you the answer to that. It says the, um, uh, the force is... Um, <clears throat> see. That's not easy to do. Um, so the force is given by, um, uh, it would be minus mx, where x is the position vector over mod x cubed, so that's the, <clears throat> the points in the right direction and um, has the right magnitude. Uh, and the observation is that that's the gradient of a, of a potential function. The potential function is, is m over mod x, so that gradient of that function is, uh, is the force. And so that's the, that's the statement that, that gravity is a, a conservative force, it doesn't depends only on the endpoints and not on the path taken if you, um, if you look at the work done uh, to move an object. And so uh, this, this function, m over mod x, is called the Newtonian potential. Um, and if we replace the point mass um, by a continuous mass distribution uh, with mass density rho of x, which is supported in some region, uh, then the corresponding potential function would be, uh, written on the slide there, phi of x, which is the integral the convolution, uh, rho, rho of y dy over mod x minus y. So that's just the, the analog for um, <clears throat> what, what you can derive from, um, from uh, Newton's law. And again, the force field uh, related to that mass distribution would be the gradient of, um, uh, of phi. And so um, for the um, transition to general relativity, it's actually more convenient to write the equation for the, to write the equation for the gravitational potential and differential form. So, so we can think of it as a PDE. Uh, <clears throat> it's the solution of the, what's called the Poisson equation. Laplacian phi is minus four pi rho, uh, and the limit uh, it goes to zero at infinity, so that normalizes for adding a constant to the solution. And the Laplace operator is, the, is just the sum of the second partials uh, in the standard coordinates. Okay, and then um, if we wanted to uh, understand the motion of, a, of a, um, a test mass in this gravitational field, we would use, uh, we would use uh, Newton's law, which is F equals ma, and that would lead, since, since the, our test particle has mass one, that <clears throat> the left-hand side is the acceleration, and the right-hand side is the force at the point. And so that's a, a nonlinear system of ODEs, uh, and <clears throat> if we specify the initial position and velocity, it has a unique solution. And so that <clears throat> is a very brief description of uh, Newtonian, uh, the Newtonian theory. Uh, now, um, <clears throat> so um, the, the space of Newtonian physics is R3. So it's just the spatial coordinates. And the laws are invariant under Euclidean isometries, translations and rotations uh, in R3. Uh, and so those are the transformations that preserve the, uh, the ordinary dot product in, in R3. Um, by contrast, the space-time of special relativity is called Minkowski space, and it's, I'll write it as R13, so it's really R4 uh, with, <clears throat> with the Lorentz signature metric. So the metric eta of VW is, is um, it's minus the product of the first coordinates, which I'll call V0 and W0, so those are thought of as the time coordinates, 
Uh, and then the spatial coordinates is the ordinary dot product. Um, uh, and uh, just to, I mean, Einstein developed special relativity with all sorts of physical, uh, physical uh, arguments, but from a mathematical point of view, in the end, uh, to be compatible with special relativity, a law or a measurement needs to be invariant under the group of isometries of eta. Okay, and so that, that group is called the Poincaré group. And so it also consists of translations together with the linear transformations that preserve that form. Now it turns out that's a much, much bigger group than, than the, um, than the uh, group of rotations. Of R it includes the rotations in R3, but it's a much, much, it's a non-compact group. It's a very large group. And so, um, and so it's quite a different, the invariance is quite a different, um, uh, a different story than, than um, uh, in Newtonian physics. And so, um, in fact, the geometry of Minkowski space is, um, a, is quite different from that of, um, of Euclidean space. So in, in, in particular, for the Lorentz inner product, you have uh, three different types of vectors at a point. So you have time-like vectors, which point, so there, there's the null vectors, which, are, which form a cone. So there's a, a future-like cone and a past, if you, if you specify the future. Uh, and um, there's... Um, um, the, the time-like directions are the ones that point inside the cone, either forward or backward, and the space-like directions are the ones that point outside. And so, um, um, and so in relativity, uh, a, a, the world path, the, the world line of a, of a physical observer is always time-like. So that's the statement that, that no, no matter or signal can travel faster than the speed of light. Okay, and so, and so the the time-like curves are the world lines of, um, of, um, of particles, and light rays travel at the speed of light, so those would travel along, along, um, along the light cone. And the space-like directions are, are two, two points that are space-like separated cannot, cannot um, uh, they, they can only uh, interact with each other after some time. So there's a, always a lapse in time that's important. Whereas in Newtonian physics, <clears throat> the the, the, uh, the law of gravity, really, there's no time involved. So, so you think of, the, you think of the, uh, the two objects as instantaneously attracting each other. And that's completely incompatible with, with uh, special relativity. So in special relativity, nothing, no signal can travel faster than, than the speed of light. Okay, and so, and so the, um, uh, this is <clears throat> the basic... Geometry and so uh, the kinds of equations that are um, that are invariant under the Lorentz or the Poincaré uh, group are um, are <coughs> equations which are generally of wave type. They're wave type equations. The simplest one is the the scalar wave equation, which I've written down there. And so it it describes a vibrating uh, three dimensional membrane, or there are various versions of the uh, the wave equation. So that equation because it's really defined in terms of the, uh, the Lorentz inner product. It's, it's, you can write it as eta ij times uij. It's invariant under Lorentz transformations. So if I take a solution uh, of u and I, I compose it with a Lorentz transformation, I get another solution, u of the same, of the same equation. Okay, and the, the Maxwell equations of electromagnetism, which I won't write down, are also Lorentz invariant. In fact, in a suitable gauge, they can be uh, written as a system of wave equations. So, so the, uh, the Maxwell equations <clears throat> do, in fact, exhibit the Lorentz invariance required. Um, now, um, in, um, in 1915, Einstein proposed the theory of general relativity, which unifies gravity and special relativity. And so the way gravity is, is incorporated into special relativity is that the, the space-time itself is given a, 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 a metric structure which is not flat. So, the, so you should think of the Minkowski space as the flat space-time in, in general relativity. But in general, the, um, the, the curvature of the space-time will replace the Newtonian potential in, in, uh, in, um, uh, in uh, Newtonian gravity. Um, and so um, I'll talk a little more about curved spaces uh, in a bit, but um, uh, the, uh, the space-time of general relativity will denote it by script S, uh, and G denotes the Lorentz metric. And so I'll say more about 
Lorentz metrics as we go along, but um, <clears throat> uh, it's a, um, it, it, it's a, it's, so S is assumed to be a smooth manifold, so it locally looks like R4, and, and at each point, the, the metric G looks, is isometric to the Euclidean metric. So the metric G defines the scalar product on the tangent space, and that scalar product is, is equivalent to the, to the um, uh, to Minkowski space, but as you move from point to point, the scalar product varies, and it's impossible in general to choose local coordinates in which the metric is the Minkowski metric. And so the inability to do that is a measure of curvature. Okay, and, so, and so that's what makes the, um, <coughs> the, um, the space-time curved. And so uh, in, a, in general relativity, the, uh, the equations of motion of a test particle, which were given by Newton's law in the, in the um, Newtonian theory, uh, are replaced by the geodesic equations. So <coughs> if you take a a uh, curved um, uh, surface or manifold, uh, you can look at geodesics, which in the Riemannian case, they would be shortest curves joining two points. Um, and they're, they're curves whose direction is parallel, which doesn't, doesn't change <clears throat> in general as you move along the curve. And so um, the, uh, the basic postulate of, of, of general relativity is that the, um, <clears throat> the motion of a unit test mass under the influence of gravity alone would travel along a time-like geodesic in, in the curved geometry. And so the geodesic equation is um, also a second-order nonlinear system of, of equations, uh, which is, looks somewhat similar. Actually, the, um, the, the right-hand side is really quadratic, a quadratic polynomial in the x prime variable. So it's a, a little simpler than the general expression there. And so, um, and so that, that equation replaces the um, uh, Newton's law in um, Newtonian gravity. And so then the key question is, well, <clears throat> we, um, we're assuming the space-time is curved. Well, we're, how did we determine the, the metric, the, the curvature of the space-time? And so the answer to that, and that was really the hard part of this whole thing, once, once, you, once you decide that gravity should be represented by the curvature of space-time, the question is, how does the metric of space-time, uh, how is it determined? And eventually, after much... Uh, uh, effort, uh, Einstein came up with the Einstein equations, which I've written in two different forms there. So, <clears throat> so I mentioned that, the, the, uh, that Riemann in the mid-19th uh, century uh, derived the invariance of um, a, a, um, a, uh, a metric in order that it be equivalent to the flat space. And so he derived what's called the Riemann curvature tensor. And the equation, the left-hand side of the Einstein equation is not the full curvature tensor, but the Ricci curvature is a trace. So it's a kind of average of, um, of the curvature tensor, and the scalar curvature is the trace of the Ricci. So, so the form of that equation is the Ricci, which is a symmetric matrix of functions locally, and then the, uh, then the, the second term is a trace term. It's minus a half r. And then the right-hand side t uh, is is a, an aspect of the matter fields which may be present in the space-time. So um, if, if the space-time had no matter, which is a perfectly reasonable assumption, say in some region uh, of space-time, then T would be zero. Okay? And so, and so that's called, those are called the vacuum Einstein equations, and they're, again, a very interesting set of equations to study. But in general, there's a, a stress-energy tensor there, T, and <clears throat> what the stress-energy encod tensor encodes is the energy and momentum densities as observed by, by any possible observer. And so, and so energy and relativity is sort of complicated because it depends, it depends on the observer. In other words, if, the, if you take two different observers moving through the same point with different world lines, then they will, be, they will see different energies. The thing that's invariant is the energy momentum vector. Okay? And, so, and so energy and, and momentum go together in... Um, in um, um, in uh, special relativity and also in general relativity. And, and they are also, that vector is also observer uh, dependent. And so there's a, a famous quote of Wheeler, John Wheeler, who was one of the very influential um, uh, uh, workers in, um, in relativity in this country. Um, actually, he was an assistant of Einstein, I, I believe. 
um, at the institute, and um, at some point. And so, um, uh, the, and he was also very good at making at, at quotable quotes. I mean, he has several of them. This this one is a description of the Einstein equations. And so the quote is that the the curvature tells matter how to move based on the geodesic equation, uh, and matter tells space time how to curve. That's that's the what the uh, uh, Einstein equations say in a very general way. And I should add that this is a slight simplification because actually initial conditions also tell space-time how to curve. So, so in order to determine a solution of the Einstein equations, uh, you, you, you need, it's not an elliptic equation, it's a wave equation, so you need, you need initial conditions also. So, so those also play a big role. And so, um, um, say the, um, the, uh, the left-hand side is, uh, as I said, the Ricci curvature. It's a second-order operator, and so to understand it, um, uh, it, it it's also coordinate invariant. So, so uh, it, it, it has different type in different coordinate systems, but, but, but if, you, if you choose coordinates which are, um, which are themselves solutions of the wave equation, so <clears throat> if the coordinates you can always do, um, <clears throat> you can find they're called wave coordinates or harmonic coordinates if in, uh, generally. Then the Ricci tensor, the Ricci uh, of G, is given by a matrix of functions which are um, uh, the first part, the second order part, is minus a half the wave operator. So it's the wave operator with respect to G of the metric components of G. And then there's a nonlinear term that involves uh, uh, the metric and its first derivatives. And so, um, so it's, a, it's what's called a quasi-linear uh, uh, system of uh, quasi-linear wave operator, and so uh, for such a for such a, a an operator, you would expect solutions to be d determined by initial conditions, and so and so I, you'll see this sketch a fair bit in the lectures. So um, <clears throat> so a solution is determined by initial data on a space-like hypersurface. So so in this picture, the right-hand side with the cones indicates that the hypersurface is space-like. That means the tangent plane intersects the light cone only at the origin. There are no null or time-like directions tangent to M. Um, and the, the picture on the left uh, indicates that, that the gravitational field and, in fact, all of the fields at the point P are determined by a compact subset of, of M. So, this is, so the, the solutions at P depend only on initial data uh, in the portion of P in the, which is in the... Um, in the past of the point P. Okay, and so that's a pr generally a property of wave equations and, and the Einstein equations uh, also satisfy that. And so, um, so the initial data, and we'll talk a lot more about, about the details of this in, in the second two lectures, but, but it's a second order equation, so there are two initial functions, two initial bits of data corresponding to the initial position and velocity. And it's a purely geometric set of equations, so they have to be geometric quantities. So the initial position is the induced metric. That's, that means the restriction of the metric G to M, so that has to be given initially. And the second fundamental form, if you remember your surface theory, you can actually think of it as the rate of change of the metric in the normal direction, uh, times a factor of two, I think. And so, and so the second fundamental form plays the role of the initial velocity for the uh, gravitational field. And then I should say, for space-times with matter, of course, there are also evolution equations, equations of motion for the matter field. So those have to be also, would, would be separately posed in the initial value problem. Okay, and so, and so the structure of the Einstein equations suggests that solutions exhibit wave-like behavior, but as I said in the introduction, this had never actually been detected physically. And in fact, it's a, it's a very uh, daunting engineering task to detect gravitational waves. And there was a long development, so LIGO and several other countries uh, uh, built gravitational wave detectors. Uh, and uh, eventually in 2016, uh, gravitational waves were detected. And <clears throat> since then, there's been a, a refinement, and so it's now relatively easy for these laser interferometers to, uh, to detect gravitational waves. And so that, uh, that led to a Nobel Prize in 2017, um, which went to, to, to um, uh, Rainer Weiss uh, and to Barry Barish and Kip Thorne uh, for their role in, in that detection. 
Okay, so I want to now move to, let's see, I think I, I go till 515. Is that correct? About that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so I want to now move to really the, 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 <clears throat> the more central topic, which I'll give, give a little more idea of, um, of, um, <clears throat> of how the proof goes, and that's, um, that's related to singularities or black holes. And so, um, so um, <clears throat> as, we, as I said, the, the first example of a space-time in general relativity is Minkowski space. So, so that would be characterized as the unique uh, flat space-time. So it has, it has curvature zero. Notice not just Ricci curvature zero, but full, the full curvature tensor is zero. Uh, so Ricci zero is not a, it doesn't locally say, say that the space-time is, uh, is trivial at all. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's, it's a wave equation. So, so there are lots and lots of solutions of that. Um, but if the curvature is zero, then, then the space-time is actually isometric to, um, to uh, Minkowski space. Okay, so um, historically, within about a year after the derivation of the Einstein equations, I think it was also in 1915 or 1916, um, the first family of exact solutions was derived by, by Carl Schwarz, Schwarzschild. Uh, and <clears throat> it was determined by the conditions that it be rotationally symmetric. So it's natural to look for rotationally symmetric solutions. When you have a PDE, you want to study some simple simplest possible examples. So he, he assumed rotational symmetry and static. So static means that, the, that there's no time dependence in the, in the uh, metric components, essentially, and also vacuum, so, so assuming there's no matter, so t equals zero. Um, actually, it was later shown around 1920 or 21 by, uh, by Birkhoff that, that the static condition could be dropped. So, so it's quite a remarkable fact about the Einstein equations that there are no dynamical solutions of the vacuum equations which are rotational, rotationally symmetric. So that might seem a little surprising. But the symmetry itself forces the solution to be stationary. That's in the vacuum case, of course. Um, and so, um, in fact, I've written down the Schwarzschild metric. In the, so the coordinates here are <clears throat> x naught, which is the time coordinate, and then r, which is a, a radial coordinate, and then, the, then g naught is the metric on the two-sphere. So, if I took m to be zero in, in, this form, in this metric, I would just have the Minkowski metric but written in spherical coordinates, right? I would have minus dx naught squared and then plus dr squared plus r squared times the metric on the sphere. So that's, that's just the, the, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Minkowski metric. So this is a family of metrics that includes the Minkowski uh, case and it has a parameter, m. Which, uh, which is taken to be positive, so it corresponds to a mass um, in, um, in relativity. And you can see that from the formula that the, um, the metric is really only defined when r is bigger than 2m, because the factor 1 minus 2m over r uh, <coughs> goes to 0, and it appears with um, an inverse there in front of the dr squared. So, so this metric is defined for r bigger than 2m, um, and and uh, and so that so it turns out to satisfy the vacuum, the vacuum Einstein equations uh, for any for any m. Okay, and so um, so the Schwarzschild metric was very quickly used to uh, justify general relativity in the sense that that um, using using the geodesics the time like geodesic in Schwarzschild in place of the ordinary ellipses that occur in the Newtonian two-body problem, uh, uh, the theory was immediately able to explain the, the deviation of the orbit of Mercury, which is the planet closest to the sun, um, which had been observed in the 19th century but couldn't be explained by Newtonian gravity. So it, it explained it with uh, up to a, a much greater uh, precision. And so that was, I think, the first test of uh, general relativity. It's based on this explicit solution, an exact solution. So um, in, in modern language, um, again, I think it was Wheeler who coined the term black hole. Uh, we say that the Schwarzschild spacetime represents a static black hole with mass m. So, so um, you can think of it as being analogous to the Newtonian potential in, in, um, in Newtonian gravity. So <clears throat> it's a rotationally symmetric solution, and, and it, it, um, it has a mass parameter, which is, is m. And actually, uh, it was discovered, as I said, in 1915, I think, 
Uh, but it was much later in 1950, initially by J.L. Singh, uh, and also by Kruskal, Martin Kruskal and George Zekeris in 1960, that the Schwarzschild spacetime as discovered by Schwarzschild was only part of a much bigger, a much larger uh, extended spacetime. So the apparent singularity at R equals 2m, it turned out, is not really a singularity at all. It's, it's just a, it, it's a coordinate singularity. So it turns out by changing coordinates, you can extend the metric across. And um, the maximal extension of Schwarzschild is a very interesting thing, so I'm going to digress just a little bit to describe it for those of you who like science fiction movies. So. Um, uh, this is a picture of the extended Schwarzschild solution. This is in the Kruskal coordinates. So the function r that was the, the radial function defined in the, in the Schwarzschild metric actually extends as a, as a smooth, in fact, analytic function to this, um, to this um, extended version. And the, um, the part there that says universe is the part of the solution that was, that was covered by the Schwarzschild uh, metric in the coordinates that Schwarzschild wrote. And the r equals 2m surface was the horizon in this picture. So the, so the, the horizon, the, and the horizons and the anti-horizon. So the function r is actually even across the, uh, when reflect, reflected across the, the center. And um, the actual singularity, so there is a singularity that appears, but it occurs at r equals zero. So it's, a, it's a, the jagged line there, <clears throat> both forward and reverse. The, the, so the, the, in, the part inside the horizon is, is is, is the black hole region. So um, the situation is that an observer, and there's a drawing there of one, so if an observer would in, theoretically be possible to cross the horizon, that's a smooth part of space time, but once, it, once the observer crossed the horizon, he would not be able to get back out. So the horizon is time-like. And so, and so the, the light cones are such that an observer can cross the horizon, but when, when uh, the observer does, it will have to fall into the singularity, into the black hole. So, so once you cross the horizon, you're, you're doomed to extinction uh, in a finite time. And so uh, the interesting thing about the picture is that it, it has a universe and it has a parallel universe on the other side. And so, so you could imagine that, <clears throat> that we live in this universe and we want to understand the, whoever lives in the parallel universe. And so, so if we try to do it, uh, what we could do is one person from our universe could cross the horizon, per, another um, person in the parallel universe could cross and they could interact with each other, have dinner together or whatever, uh, and, but neither one would be able to communicate with their friends as to what the, was going on in the, in the, in the parallel universe. And so, so even though there are these parallel universes, they, cannot, they can communicate with each other, but they can't they can't send back, they can't let people in the, in the uh, universe or parallel universe know what the other people are like. So, so it's kind of an interesting, uh, an, an interesting scenario. Um, so I think realistically, the um, uh, physicists think that the, the realistic part of this is, the, is the, the exterior part, the original short shield, and the part, and the part behind the horizon, so the, the black and the white holes. So I should say, by the way, it looks like there might be a singularity at zero in this picture, but, um, but each point of this is, a, this is a picture where each point represents a two-sphere, and the radius of the two-sphere depends on, depends on the coordinates, the two-dimensional coordinates in, that, in, in the picture. So the radius varies from point to point. In fact, I have drawn here. So if I look at the original, uh, <clears throat> if I look at the original t equals zero slice or x naught equals zero slice, that would be the horizontal um, um, curve in that picture. So what it looks like geometrically, so a better sketch of that is um, uh, this would be the extended spatial Schwarzschild manifold. And so what happens is at the, at the center there is that red circle, which is the, the, the horizon of Schwarzschild. And as R goes to infinity, the spheres grow, and they, uh, they grow roughly at the same rate as Euclidean spheres. So both forward and backward. So there, there are the two uh, the two spatial ends of, um, <clears throat> of Schwarzschild. And actually, this picture will be very important for not only this lecture, but also the next two. And so, um, so there are various notions that come from this picture, in particular, the general notions of energy and momentum for, for, um, for general space times, 
as well as the notion of trap surfaces. So we'll talk more about that later um, in, 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 this, in this lecture, and also, I guess, yeah, mostly in this lecture. So, um, so it's a very important example that, that it's important both physically because it allows calculations which, uh, which are slightly different from Newtonian ones, and also mathematically because it leads to some very general notions. Okay, so now I want to come to uh, <clears throat> the ideas behind the singularity theorem. So, um, so just to motivate it, before the 50s and 60s, much of general relativity was centered around finding exact solutions. So, so the exact solutions were, I mean, there are various exact solutions which have all sorts of, I mean, even um, if, you, if you look it up, <clears throat> even, uh, even Gödel has a solution of the, of the Einstein equations. There's a Gödel universe. And so, um, so the solutions, of course, in order to write down a solution of this set of equations, you have to assume a lot of symmetry. You make very special assumptions. And so um, it it's, was observed that the solutions um, that were known were all singular. So no, in other words, there, there were no complete solutions. So you couldn't, nobody was able to write down a, a solution, say, of the vacuum Einstein equations, which didn't have a singularity. And so, and so the question of whether that was just a relic of the symmetry of the solutions or whether that is a general feature of uh, uh, dynamical solutions of the Einstein equations was, was, uh, was really not known at all until uh, in 1965, Penrose proved, um, I say the first version because there were several refinements later of it, uh, <clears throat> which isolates the essential feature of the Schwarzschild metric, which forces any solution near it, for example, uh, to, uh, near it initially to become singular at a future time. So he gave um, the theorem gives a general criterion which forces the space-time to be singular in a precise sense, and, and we'll talk about that. But then later, uh, together with um, um, Stephen Hawking, uh, they prove several other versions of the theorem, which, for example, lead to statements about uh, the existence of, um, of uh, a big bang, you know, in a, in a robust sort of, sort of set of cosmological models. So, so generally, in relativity, if, uh, if you have a, a solution which has a compact Cauchy surface, that's called a cosmological spacetime. It's intended to model the, the universe rather than uh, Schwarzschild. The Schwarzschild spacetime only is the gravitational field um, uh, which is generated by a single object. So it's, a, it's called an isolated system. And so there, there are sort of two different uh, types of solutions that one considers. Um, and so... Um, let me first say something about energy conditions. In fact, these will play a role throughout the lectures. And so <clears throat> the theorem, such as the singularity theorem, which is, we're, it's going to be a very general theorem uh, about, <clears throat> about solutions of the Einstein equations. So they, they, in particular, it allows matter, but it doesn't specify any particular type of matter field. So it works for any type of matter field which satisfies certain conditions. So notice if, if we don't, if, if, we, if we don't impose any conditions on the, on, on the matter field, we could simply take any Lorentz metric and define T as the right-hand side, and there's no, nothing you can say at all. And so, um, <clears throat> so the, uh, the, types of, the types of conditions on T, which are physically natural, are energy conditions. So they're conditions such as um, the, the energy density of the matter should be positive or non-negative um, for any observer. Now, that's a little more complicated in relativity than it, than it seems because... Um, you think of the energy density as just being a function, but, it, but it's actually, again, observer-dependent, and it's, it's linked to the momentum. So, so, uh, so there actually are several different energy conditions that, uh, that occur, and I, I just want to describe some of them. So, so one of them would be, so, so if I took, a, if we take a, a time-like vector, which is thought of as the world line of an observer, then we can, we can look at the tensor T applied to VV. So T is a... a, a, a a tensor like the metric, so you can apply it to a vector. And so, so that quantity, T is built so that that quantity is the observed energy, sorry, that should be the observed energy, <clears throat> not momentum. So it's just the observed energy for the observer. And um, so the requirement that, that, that it's non-negative for all observers is called the weak energy condition. So that's, that's the first reasonable energy condition you, you could expect. But now, um, 
there's a, so, so the weak energy condition implies that also T is a smooth tensor, so if it's non negative for any time like vector, I can, it's also non negative for any null vector. And so, and so we, can, we can consider the, similar, the same condition for null vectors. And then from the Einstein equations, that would imply the left hand side. The TVV is equal to the left hand side, which is, uh, right, the left hand side is, would be Ricci minus one half RG. Uh, on the other hand, V is null, so GVV is zero. So, so that implies that the Ricci uh, uh, VV is non-negative for every null, every null vector. So that's, that's uh, called the null convergence condition. And it turns out to be sufficient to uh, prove at least the, the original, the first form of the singularity theorem. So that, that's one important condition we'll, we'll consider. And, and it, it's actually weaker than the, than the weak energy condition. So it's, so it's quite a weak... Uh, considered to be quite a weak um, uh, energy condition which you know, any, any reasonable matter should satisfy. Now there's a, 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 a stronger one which is important for other versions of the singularity theorem and also for the kinds of theorems that uh, we're going to talk about in the later lectures. And this, it's called the dominant energy condition. And um, <clears throat> it can be, um, so it can be defined as the statement that T of VW is non-negative for all forward-pointing time-like vectors. So we assume we have a forward time direction. Then we can look at time-like vectors which point, uh, which point, both point forward. And then we can require that that be non-negative for all forward vectors. So that, that, that actually, just using linear algebra, you can see it's, it's, it's the condition that for any observer, uh, the energy density is non-negative and the energy momentum density vector is time-like or null. So that's sort of the statement that, that no physical signal can travel faster than the speed of light. So again, it's, um, it's, it's a very reasonable energy condition. If you look at it for a fluid, a perfect fluid, which is one of the standard um, uh, physical uh, fields that are used in relativity, then um, it actually imposes a restriction on the pressure in terms of the density. So it tells you that the, the pressure uh, in absolute value is smaller than, less than or equal to the density. So, so it's not, you know, it's conceivable you could have a, a field which violates the dominant energy condition, but many, but many of the theorems require that condition in order to, in order to hold. I think if, if you look in the physics literature, you'll find, um, <clears throat> you'll find uh, papers where they, they, Imagine that the dominant energy condition is violated at some, in some uh, epoch of the uh, universe, and then they, they can um, look at consequences of that. Okay, but we'll assume that. <clears throat> okay, and so what's important for, so there, there are many different guises that curvature uh, can take, and the important thing from, um, from the singularity theorem is that, um, <clears throat> so the energy conditions, of course, using the Einstein equations give you curvature conditions. And so, and so, roughly speaking, they give you some sort of positivity conditions on the curvature. And so, um, in particular, the null, the null convergence condition directly gives you that the Ricci is non-negative in null directions. And so, um, so the, uh, the, the important thing is that the sign of the curvature determines focusing or defocusing of families of geodesics. So that's really what's crucial. And so you can see those little ants live on these curved surfaces. And so the one on the zero surface the two geodesics which start parallel remain parallel, right? In the positive curvature case, if, if two geodesics start parallel, they tend to come together, and actually they, fo they will focus at the opposite point, on the, if that's actually a round sphere, whereas for negative curvature, the two geodesics starting parallel will diverge. And so uh, so that's, the <clears throat> that's the basic property of... Um, so it's the effect of, of, of the sign of the curvature on the focusing or defocusing of geodesics, which is important in the singularity theorem. Okay, so in particular, <clears throat> in the presence of non-negative curvature, um, if a family of geodesics is initially focusing, then it will encounter a focal point in a finite distance because the, 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 uh, the non-negative curvature tells you that if, if, they, if it's focusing, then the rate of focusing increases in time. And so, and so you encounter... Uh, a, a focal point in finite distance. Uh, well, for non-negative Ricci, so as I said, Ricci is not the full curvature tensor, but for non-negative Ricci, the same is true if you consider um, 
a uh, geodesic congruence, or, uh, which means a, a foliation by geodesic. So the two kinds of geodesic congruences were, which are important would be if you, you take a point and you consider all geodesics that emanate from the point. So, um, so that's, <clears throat> that's one sort of congruence. The other would be if you take a hypersurface and you consider all the normal geodesics. So those, again, foliate, and, um, and then you can apply this idea to uh, um, the non-negative Ricci to situations like that. And there's another slightly more subtle one, which is the null congruence, um, which is used in the, um, in the, uh, <clears throat> uh, in the singularity theorem. So, so now, what does a focal point do for us? Well, in, in Riemannian geometry, as you, you had a course in it, you probably know that after a focal point, uh, a geodesic can no longer minimize length. And so, um, so for example, the great circles on the sphere minimize until the, the opposite point, and then after that, they no longer. They continue as geodesics, but they don't minimize. Okay, and, and um, th the same thing is true in, um, in Lorentz geometry for time-like geodesics. So time-like geodesics actually are locally length maximizing. And so... Uh, it's also true that after a focal point, uh, they no longer maximize. Now, for null geodesics, it's a little more subtle. So, so for null geodesics, <clears throat> after, the, after a uh, focal point, they become time-like separated from, from wherever you started. So if you emanate from a point, then they're time-like separated from the point or from, from a surface. So they move, in other words, from the null boundary of the future to the interior. And let me illustrate that to try to make that reasonable. Um, so, um, so let's consider um, a cylinder. So let's take, let's take the two-sphere. It could be any, any, any n-sphere. And let's look at the Lorentz product metric, minus dt squared plus g. g is just the standard round metric on S2. So if I, if I start at a point, so time zero and a given point on the sphere, then the future of that point consists of all points uh, TQ where T is bigger than the distance from P to Q. Right? Because <clears throat> for any, so locally for nearby points that would just look like the Euclidean, the Minkowski light cone. Um, <clears throat> and so, so such points could be joined by a time-like geodesic, which I've written there, S here is an arc length parameter, so it's TS over L sigma of S. So that's, that's a time-like curve in um, relative to this metric, where L is the distance from P to Q, uh, and uh, sigma is a minimizing geodesic from P to Q. So, so, um, so in particular, um, the future, is, I don't have much space to draw here, but, um, but if I took my cylinder here, <clears throat> imagine a cylinder here, I take a point on it, I take the future of the point, then locally I just get a picture that looks like the Minkowski uh, uh, light cone, the future light cone. But then when the geodesics hit the opposite point at time pi, which would be uh, later, then everything above that point is in the, is in the future, right? It's, uh, so, those, so even though those null geodesics extend, they can be deformed locally to time-like curves. And so that's what happens after a, uh, a focal point for null geodesics. So it means that they, even though they're, they're, um, they're, they're uh, null geodesics, they can be deformed, fixing the endpoints to a time-like geodesic. So, so that's, uh, that's the, um, um, the basic future. And there I've just stated what I just said, that, <clears throat> that the, null, the null geodesics continue, uh, and they're, they lie on the boundary of the future up until uh, arc length pi, and then after that, they lie in the future. So they move from the boundary to the interior. So that's the, the basic picture. Okay, and so um, one other notion I need. Um, and so, um, so if I, if I take a two-dimensional surface, space-like surface in a four-dimensional space-time, then the normal space is a two-dimensional Lorentz manifold. And so it contains a pair of lines which are null. The, the null cone intersected with the normal plane is just a pair of lines. And so, and so those two lines, we fix a future direction <clears throat> those two null directions are called ingoing and outgoing uh, null directions, and we can look at geodesics in, in those directions. And so, and so the, um, the, the notion that a surface be trapped is that, and I have a little picture of it there, is that um, 
when we move along the family of null geodesics, either outgoing or ingoing, the, the, we have focusing. In other words, the, the, um, the, uh, the, average, um, the average focusing uh, rate of change of the focusing is positive, is not negative. Okay. And, so, um, and so that's what it means for a surface to be trapped. And, and actually, there's a, a weaker notion, which is outer trap. So if we're able somehow to distinguish the inward from the outward directions, then we could require trapping, say, just in the outward directions. Okay, and so the intuitively speaking, if you consider the spatial short shield metric, then if you consider the round spheres, the, the central sphere there is the horizon, so that's marginally trapped. But if you go behind the horizon, so if we fix a time direction, say that we fix the, the top part to be, <clears throat> to be the uh, exterior, um, uh, the, uh, the exterior uh, space, space portion of space time, then the, 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 the spheres behind the horizon are trapped. Th those are trapped surfaces. So if I move, um, if I move in, the, in either null direction, the areas will decrease. So in that picture, you can see that if you move outward, uh, the, they shrink, right? The area shrinks, uh, decreases. And so the condition of trapping is a condition on the mean curvature in the null directions for the, surf for the surfaces. So this, uh, this um, um, measure of average, um, uh, uh, average expansion or contraction is, act is actually what's called the mean curvature in, in, um, in geometry. <clears throat> okay, and so there's one other ingredient that's needed in the singularity theorem. It's called global hyperbolicity. And again, I have that same picture, the initial value problem. So it just means that it means that um, there's a Cauchy surface. That means there's a a space-like hypersurface, and every point in the space-time is determined by data on that surface. So if I look at a point, say, to the future of that surface, and I look at its past, it intersects the Cauchy surface in a compact set. And so that's what you might call a predictable space-time. So it's, it's called globally hyperbolic. Now, the nice thing about that from a geometric point of view is that global hyperbolicity allows us... So it's a little bit like... Um, like completeness in Riemannian geometry. So it, it allows us to take, for example, two points for which there's a time-like curve and construct a maximizing time-like curve, a geodesic between them. Or similarly, um, we can construct, if we, take a, if we take the future of a point or a surface and we look at a point on the boundary of it, we can construct a null geodesic from <clears throat> that point to the, original, to the original point. That null geodesic is necessarily free of focal points because remember we showed or we, we said that, that if you're beyond a focal point, you lie in the interior. You're not on the boundary. So that's a, that's a crucial thing. And so there's, there's a global assumption. So I have a picture here just in Minkowski space. So if I look at the future of the, 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 the vertex point there, the cone, uh, then, then the future is the interior of the light cone. And of course, every point can be joined by a uh, time-like geodesic. Um, and if I look at the boundary of that, then, there's a, then it's foliated by null geodesics. Um, uh, and those null geodesics, so in Minkowski space, there's no focusing. So these are, these are um, they're, all, uh, they're all genuinely on the boundary of, um, of the future. Okay, and so, um, <clears throat> so a space-time is called null geodesically complete if any null geodesic extends for infinite parameter distance. So null geodesics, of course, have zero length, so, so arc length doesn't make sense. But nonetheless, there's a, a up to an affine change, there's a, a unique parameter that's defined. So it makes sense to say that the geodesic extends forever, or it extends for infinite parameter distance. And so, and so if it doesn't, if we take a, a null geodesic that somehow ends in finite time, the, the suggestion would be that the geodesic encounters a singularity. Like in, in the Schwarzschild example, there, the null geodesic might hit that, that, singular, that singular point at r equals zero. And so, um, and so um, a space-time not being geodesically complete would, dis would suggest that it's singular. That's the key, the key idea. And so uh, we can now state the singularity theorem. So, um, if we, so we, we assume it's globally hyperbolic, so we have the, the existence of geodesics, uh, and we assume it's... Uh, uh, it, it, it has a non-compact Cauchy surface, so that's very important, as, for, as 
well, for example, the example I gave. So it's um, <clears throat> so it's, uh, it has a non-compact Cauchy surface, and then if it contains, uh, if it satisfies the null convergence condition and contains a closed trap surface, uh, that it's hard to distinguish those S's, but that's a, a regular S in the space-time of a uh, a uh, script S. Then then S cannot be null geodesically complete. In fact, if if the surface S bounds a compact region in a Cauchy surface, which is a reasonable assumption, then in fact it's enough <clears throat> that the surface be outer trapped. So, so then you can distinguish the outer, the outward pointing uh, directions and we would just require outer trapping to do that. So almost done here. Okay, and so actually I've got a quick sketch of the proof here. We've introduced all the ingredients that are needed. Um, the idea is that <clears throat> because the original surface is trapped, um, the null geodesics emanating orthogonally from that surface will, <clears throat> will, um, will end in a finite distance or a finite parameter <clears throat> distance. In fact, they'll move to the interior, so they will, they will encounter focal points. And so in particular, you can, you, you can conclude based on the fact that, the, that, the, um, that on the boundary, you always do have these null geodesics without focal points, you can conclude that the boundary of the future is actually compact. It's a compact set. But on the other hand, it's a, it's, it's a, um, it's a null hypersurface in this, in this um, uh, globally hyperbolic space-time, uh, which has no boundary. And so in a globally hyperbolic space, all of the, any, any boundaryless space-like or null hypersurface is a Cauchy surface. And so it's homeomorphic to a Cauchy surface because because any time-like geodesic will intersect both of them at a single point. And so you can think of you know, the assignment which sends one point to the other. So, so in particular, you would have a compact Cauchy surface, but that's, that's not possible because we assumed that there was a, a Cauchy surface that were non-compact. Okay? And so that's how the singularity theorem goes. So it's, a, it's a, in some sense a very abstract theorem. It's very much in the spirit of Riemannian geometry. So, so if you have no Riemannian geometry, it could remind you of the Meyer, myers bonnet theorem, for example, for Ricci, non-negative. But it's a bit more subtle than that, though. But um, anyway, so, so again, if, if, um, there's a if, if there's a Cauchy surface and S bounds a region in that, then it's enough to assume it's um, non-compact. So it gives you a very neat criterion for, for um, showing that the solution of the initial value problem uh, must be singular. So, for example, if your initial manifold had a... Um, had a trap surface, uh, then the evolved space-time would necessarily be singular. So, it, so it's quite a convenient and rel relatively easily checked uh, criterion for singularity. Okay, and so, um, so it's an old result. And I, as I said, it's a, it's a very fundamental result in um, theoretical work on the Einstein equations. We use it all the time. Um, and over recent decades, more observational work has been done, which suggests that black holes are present in our galaxy. Uh, and in 2020, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to Roger Penrose for the discovery that black hole formation is a robust prediction of the general theory of relativity, and also to um, uh, Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Goetz for the discovery of a massive compact object at the center of our galaxy. So the, Penrose got it for the, the theorem, a rigorous mathematical geometric theorem, and the other two got it for observational work uh, on on this presumably black hole at the center of our galaxy. The, the Nobel Committee is rather conservative, so they didn't want to use the word black hole. They just said, instead, supermassive compact object. You'll notice in, in their, their work. So anyway, it, I thought it was an interesting story, and it gives me a chance to introduce some of the ideas that we'll use in the next two lectures. So, so um, that's all I have. <clears throat> Yes. And this was put in general, in general, shown by? In ge yeah, the, it, it was proven, say it again. It was proved by, by who it was proved? By, by Penrose. By Penrose. Yeah, in 1965. The, the version I described was the original Penrose theorem. So he and Hawking later um, gave some different versions of it. But.
Yeah. So, for example, it, uh, yeah. So, in, in, in particular, any perturbation of the, if you perturb the initial data of short shield, of short shield you can solve the, the Einstein equations, and then that corresponding space time would also be singular, necessarily. So, so it's a it's a statement of uh, stability of singularities, or it's a general criterion, sort of like a bubble. So, if you had a bubble in your initial data, then 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 the you can you can rigorously show that the evolved space time is will be singular. Yeah, sure. You mean if you just considered the short shield space time? Oh, um, well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it implies that the short shield space time must be singular. Yeah, that, that would be, that would prove that the space time is singular, but of course you know explicitly in the in the in the short shield case what the singularities look like. So it doesn't add anything in the short shield case, but what it shows is that the short shield behavior is robust in some sense. If you perturb the short shield data, you would also you also get get singular. Any comments? So you cannot get rid of the singularities yet by simply a small perturbation. Right. So the singularities are not due to the symmetry of Schwarzschild or anything like that. Right. So there's really a um, <clears throat> there's really a geometric phenomenon, a geometric property which forces the singularities. That that's the the main contribution of the. Yeah. Yeah. You could think of it. So these uh, this the surface you could think of as being contained in a Cauchy surface, and then. And then, yeah. So then, if you if the surface is trapped, then then the the solution would be uh, singular. So, in this theorem, you formulate the singularities and the incompleteness of your data. So, is there a way to relate this with uh, the curvature becoming very strong? So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course, geodesics focus even when the curvature is is not going to infinity. So, so yeah. The, I mean, it, it's a big challenge to. In fact, Penrose, after doing this, made various conjectures about the nature of these singularities. So, you would hope that the singularity is a black hole, which by which would mean that it it has an associated event horizon. So that's really far from being known. Um, so even that statement for perturbations of uh, Schwarzschild and Kerr. So there's Schwarzschild is actually was generalized to rotating black holes, uh, which are also exact solutions. So so even if you take perturbed data for those, um, the question of whether um, whether the singularity is of the right type, in other words, whether what's expected is that if you if you perturb a Kerr solution, you solve the initial value problem, it will settle down to a, some other Kerr solution, and it will uh, you know be have a uh, black hole singularity. So that's a really hard, that's a theorem in hyperbolic PDE. There are lots of people working on it. There's a lot of work these days on, uh, on the dynamics of the Einstein equations, but most of it is restricted to, um, you know, perturbations, you know, perturbations of given solutions. Um, but yeah, that's a big challenge, which I, you know, I, if, I, if I saw it in my lifetime, I'd be surprised. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Hawking later discovered Hawking radiation, which says that if you take such a black hole in isolation with no other matter flowing in and you just let it sit there, it radiates the thermal radiation, which makes it smaller and smaller, and eventually it makes it disappear in a big right. poof. Uh, what is it about the, and that was a result of quantum mechanical behavior of uh, particles in, this, in, in the neighborhood of the horizon. What is it of that? quantum mechanical radiation that violates the, uh, the conditions of the Penrose theorem? Um, actually, no, I, I don't think it violates. I, I think that's based, on, um, that's based on the properties of the Kerr, the rotating black holes. Um, the fact that the, um, I think it's based on the fact that the, um, the killing vector field, which is VDT, becomes space-like in a certain region inside what's called the ergosphere. Of Kerr, and that and that allows radiation to to uh, escape the black hole, um, and so um, so I, it doesn't. It, yeah, I mean, so the the Penrose singularity theorem is very general in that it says it says nothing really about the nature of the singularity. So so there's nothing um, 
No, I think that's a phenomenon which is consistent with energy conditions and uh, the conditions that we've assumed. So that's more related to the, the interior structure, the, the actual structure of the black hole. But after the black hole has evaporated, there is no singularity left, right? Uh, if, if, it, if it evaporates, yeah, then it would be smooth, right? Uh -huh. the, the solution there. Well, the singularity has managed to get rid of itself. So somehow, yeah. uh, that must oh, be I something see. that uh, violates the original. But, but the space time would still be incomplete. If, if, I mean, if, even if the black hole later evaporated, you would still have, it would still be an incomplete space time. So it doesn't really violate the. Uh, yes. Yeah. I understood you correctly. Uh, the two crucial ingredients for this theorem is uh, the existence of the trapped surface and this uh, energy condition on the, uh, the, the matter which is collapsed. Plus a, a non-compact Cauchy surface. Third one. Yeah. yeah. And so now just as the previous comment, um, uh, so there is this black body radiation that comes out as a consequence of the quantum mechanical formulation. And in your estimation, so considering, a, say, a nice uh, spherical, not a locally, just a spherical, but maybe perturbed slightly, but uh, essentially a spherical, in your estimation, uh, but which of these uh, three uh, items, compact surface, uh, the Cauchy surface, and the energy condition, which of these, in your estimation, would be violated uh, then uh, in light of this Hawkins of radiation? So you mean assuming the black hole radiates away? Or? radiates and ultimately uh, that you have this point of singularity there, uh, sitting uh, there, which mathematically people have not been uh, actually been able to describe, you know, but simply because you're talking about a quantum mechanically right. Uh, right. very, very tiny. Well, I'm, I'm afraid this theorem doesn't really see quantum mechanics. It's, it's really a theorem about the Einstein equations. So, um, there's no real there's no real contradiction because <clears throat> because um, any singularity in the space time would satisfy the conclusions of the theorem. Um, yeah, I mean I'm I'm not I'm not really a physicist, so so I, I couldn't speculate about about. Uh, uh, so that would be yeah, so you, you, need, you need some theory that takes quantum mechanics into account in order to do that. Um, I know that in string theory there are um, ways of understanding the Hawking radiation. Um, maybe, I mean, that's a theory that's supposed to include both, um, both um, gra gravity and, um, and uh, quantum effects. But, but the Einstein equations themselves are classical equations that don't include quantum mechanics. So, so I don't really know how you would incorporate that into, the, into this theorem at all. Yeah. <clears throat>